a lot of things have happened in, uh, in the management of prostate cancer over the last decade or so. Uh, perhaps it's the recognition that treatment intensification uh, remains, or perhaps it's now the standard of care for uh, every patient who develops advanced disease. Uh, so uh, my talk really related to uh, the standard practices uh, throughout the United States and certainly practices that I believe are the standard, should be standard throughout the world. That is that uh, when you see a patient with uh, de novo metastatic disease and or someone who has undergone surgery, radiation, uh, and or, uh, you know, either or, or develops systemic disease objectively, uh, then the standard of care is no longer suppression of testosterone. Uh, we do suppression of testosterone by uh, giving patients either uh, take them to surgical orchiectomies or doing medical orchiectomies specifically with GnRH analogs or antagonists uh, blocking the uh, connectivity via lamitus, that expression between brain and testicles. So testosterone goes down to a castrated level. That has been historically the standard of care for many years. However, over the last uh, decade or so, uh, multiple randomized clinical trials, level one evidence, have demonstrated that the addition of systemic therapy to that androgen deprivation approach, it is of paramount importance for our patients. When you think of that, part of my discussion related to the importance of defining volume of disease, and volume simplistically is the amount of disease that you have throughout your scans, and also the location of where those lesions are. Although there may be multiple ways of defining uh, volume, uh, they really, we, we really think pragmatically in two types of patients, those with low volume disease and those with high volume disease. Uh, for those patients with low volume disease, you know, the standard of care is to suppress male hormone and to add one of the novel androgen receptor inhibitors, uh, either uh, apalutamide, or ensalutamide or darlutamide, recently FDA approved in the United States, actually over the last uh, seven days or so. Uh, adrenal biosynthesis inhibitor, specifically abiraterone acetate, is also standard of care for uh, this selected group of patients. Now, when you think of the addition of docetaxel-based chemotherapy, although one could argue that low volume patients can also embark on docetaxel, I think most of us in clinical practice are reserving docetaxel for those patients with high volume disease. So regardless of volume, high or low volume, the same treatments remain the, the best option for our patients. What changes is that if you have low volume disease and you happen to have your primary tumor in place, there is a role for primary radiotherapy to that prostate gland. So basically you do androgen deprivation therapy, you pick the best systemic therapy that you have, either an ARI or an adrenal biosynthesis inhibitor, or for that matter, chemotherapy, and you complete a radiation therapy to a primary tumor. That is the best data that we have to improve outcome for those patients. Now, contrary for those patients with high volume disease, the standard of care is to, yet again, to suppress uh, testosterone production with ADT and to add treatment intensification with uh, AB or an ARI or chemotherapy for that matter. But if you have a patient who has their primary tumor in place, there doesn't appear to be a role for primary radiation therapy to those patients. Uh, equally important is the recognition that uh, within those patients with low volume disease, we have a subset of patients uh, also known as having oligometastatic disease, which is very little disease. And although the true definition of oligometastatic disease is not well defined, we still debate uh, as to the number and the location, if it's bone only or lymph node only, or the combination of both with a restricted number of lesions, three to five. Having said that, uh, we have recognized that a very selected group of patients should be able to actually do quite well if you treatment intensify them uh, with ADT plus one of those agents that I described earlier and also to consider uh, radiation therapy to those sites of oligometastatic disease. Uh, there is emerging data to suggest that uh, even when you complete that, get the patients off their systemic therapy, once they recover testosterone production, then some patients can be rendered free of disease for years. So that is uh, a big aspect of what we've been trying to do. We also mentioned something about 
uh, the importance of PSMA imaging, uh, certainly the utility of the use of uh, traditional CT scans and technetium 99 bone scans have become obsolete for us in prostate cancer. Now, uh, the technology that we use is far more sophisticated. Uh, and we really are talking about PSMA driven uh, technology uh, using PET scan where you use F18 or gallium 11. Uh, bottom line is uh, when you do that sophisticated technology and use it for our patients, then you're more likely to find disease. And the bigger question in the field right now is if you were to find PSMA AVI disease in an otherwise patient, in, in a patient who did have a negative bone scan and a traditional CT scan without objective disease, if that patient would drastically, uh, if, if, if that new imaging technology would change how you think of that patient, meaning patients were non-metastatic in conventional imaging and now become metastatic in the PET imaging. Uh, I think for us right now, there's still uh, some concerns as to false positives and whether or not if every metabolic uptake that you see is consistent with metastatic disease, if you need to be a biopsy or not, I think there's areas in, in, in the space where we continue to struggle, but I think for the most part, most of us who are seeing uh, high SUV activity in sites of uh, metastatic disease, we're thinking of those patients as metastatic in nature and proceeding with the treatments that I just uh, described. Uh, equally important is the recognition that PSMA uh, 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 can also be used as a therapeutic option for our patients. Certainly, we have the uh, right now in the United States the approval of LU77 PSMA, which is Rutetium 177, uh, based upon the Vision trial, which is a trial that was done in uh, late patients in the castration refractory setting, post chemo, post oral therapy uh, with PSMA AVI disease proven by PET PSMA. Uh, I think that the field is moving forward and trying to move that technology earlier in the castration sensitive space. So we talk a little bit about that sequence of events. And lastly, uh, one of the biggest concerns that uh, or controversies right now in the field relate as to uh, how we pick uh, treatments. Uh, two important trials were discussed, one called PEACE-1, and then looks at triple therapy. And by that, I mean suppression of testosterone, six cycles of docetaxel, followed by an adrenal biosynthesis inhibitor, or the Arison's data that talks about triple therapy, but instead of doing it in a sequential manner, you do suppression of testosterone with ADT, six cycles of docetaxel, while you have the patient on an androgen receptor inhibitor known as darolutamide. Those two trials, certainly Arasens demonstrated a survival benefit for patients getting ADT uh, chemo and the androgen receptor inhibitor compared to ADT and chemotherapy. But that raises the question is whether or not, you know, that triple approach for high volume patients is better uh, than ADT plus one of the novel hormonal agents. And that data, we don't have it. So I think right now the complexity in the field is that for us, when we see high volume patients, now we're debating the merits of doing triple therapy. And if you do so, the question is triple at front or triple in a sequence, meaning ADT chemo followed by. Um, those are areas where we actually uh, still need to understand maybe a bit more of biomarker driven data, perhaps more molecular driven uh, ways to define uh, our patient population rather than just by simple volume. Um, so those are so, some of the aspects that we we'll review in our presentation. So I think that unequivocally, one of the concerns that we have is if we look at actually uh, marketing analysis in the United States at the very least, uh, a significant proportion of our patients with metastatic disease are not receiving uh, treatment intensification, which to me is sort of uh, uh, hard to understand why not since we've been talking about these agents for the last uh, five, seven years or so with very compelling data. So I think what that has changed is that now we can talk to patients and actually illustrates to them the importance of intensification. There's a drastic improvement in survival. There is a significant delay in time to progression, specifically defined by radiographic findings or symptomatic disease or from death for any cause, and certainly have the ability to control active disease with controlling symptoms, 
and by default, making scans, uh, at least for those patients with measurable disease, uh, you can actually do uh, some solid responses, not only serologically, but radiographically as well. So I think what, if you start with the best approach up front, what that creates to some extent is that limits and or challenge the sequence of events when people become castration resistant. And I can tell you right now that if you do ADT, chemo, plus an oral novel hormonal agent, as you move into the castration resistant space, probably most people will actually put a patient on a lutetium PSMA approach now that it's approved. On the contrary, if you initiate therapy with ADT and an, and an oral agent, the certainly chemotherapy in the sequential setting becomes important. Lutetium may be also relevant, at least for those who have seen chemotherapy, but it challenged the sequence of management when you become castration resistant. Equally important is the recognition, as I said earlier as well, of the importance of genomics. So we have to actually look at germline mutations. We have to look at somatic mutations for our patients with advanced disease as we may be able to identify subsets of patients who may be candidates for PARP inhibitors as well, especially those who have DNA repair deficiencies or homologous recombination repair deficiencies. There's also the opportunity for selected group, a smaller group, uh, but still the option for some selected patients in a tumor agnostic manner to receive immune check blockade uh, with agents such as nivolumab and or pembrolizumab. Uh, two checkpoint inhibitors that are able to block PD-1 pathway. Uh, and that is specifically for patients with uh, macrosatellite and stable tumors or patients with tumor mutational burden uh, over 10% or so. So definitely uh, genomics have become part of what we do and uh, critically important not only to counsel patients, but also to define therapeutic alternatives as, as people move through the natural sequence of events. Mm -hmm.